Please welcome United States Ambassador to the Republic of India, Eric Garcetti, in conversation with Skift founder and CEO, Rafit Ali. Now I see why you have the yellow on. I do, Matches yes. The uh, we are very particular about our chairs. <laughs> well, Ambassador, it's an honor for, you, for, for, for us, for you to be here. Thank you. And, great uh, to be here. Great to be with all of you. Thank you for having me. And the one thing we share is our love for LA. Yes. I used to live in LA, and obviously yeah. you're Angelina as well. Yeah. Um, let me start with this question. So I'm going to let people settle down a little bit. Um, it's all right. This is always the toughest, like, slot, right? Everybody's digesting. You're, we'll try to keep you awake because all the blood's rushing to your stomach right now. So the good news is even though he's the ambassador, as you can see, he's very casual. I've watched enough videos of him being interviewed that we'll have a good conversation Absolutely. back and forth. What spice level can you handle? I, I think pretty high. I'm half Mexican. And it's funny that um, my father's side of the family is Mexican. So my grandfather used to give me jalapenos growing up to eat raw. I can't really eat food without some spiciness in it. And I can go pretty high. I was in Nagaland, you know, in the Northeast. Yes, of, of course. They have the highest some of the called. Yeah, they have some of the hottest um, peppers there that you eat in some interesting assemblages. So I was eating hornets and chili eating peppers together. Hornets and... Yeah, they give you like a plate of hornets. Wow. I think the stingers are inert or gone. And chilies. And it's one of the best dishes I've actually had since I've been here. Um, so I go pretty spicy. This morning I woke up in a different state. I just came from the airport in Andhra Pradesh, which is known for its spicy food. Had a really great Andhra fish curry last night. So I'd say I can tolerate almost the top, but I, I come in, my preference would be like a 6-7 maybe. And it's not just because your heritage is... Uh Mexican, yeah. but also because your love for India, you've been in, yeah. you have a long history going back to India. Yep. By the way, the spice question was so that I can then calibrate my questions based on the spice level <laughs> that you can have. For questions, ten, 10, I can go 10, don't ten. worry. Okay, all right. Let's What's your that. spice level, by the way? What can uh, you take? My, I can, I eat chilies with each oh, good, on yeah. dinner. My family is here somewhere. They can attest good, good. Uh, to that. Where's the family? My Where's mom's right there, sitting right there. Mom, oh my gosh. You should be so proud of your son. I hope you are. He's really, fi he finally turned out something. <laughs> the history is this is the first time she's seen me in action ever in my 30 years career. Wow, so, that's amazing. Um, which is amazing. Um, so, your history with India. Yeah. Uh, give people a sense of your history with sure. India. So, I first came to uh, India, here to Delhi, it was the first stop in 1985. I was 14 years old. My sister is two years older, and I came here because my parents. They had met actually in the travel industry. Um, oh, they were in the travel industry? My mom worked for Pan Am Airlines as wow. a flight attendant right after college. Uh, not flight attendant, excuse me, a, um, a booking agent. And my dad was looking for a summer job because he grew up in a pretty poor family and had never left the country. And he had just graduated from college, so he was working as like an office boy for Pan Am Airlines. And six weeks before he was going to leave the country for the first time, he asked my mom out on a date. And two days before they left, they got married. So, and they're still married and alive today. So you, you had to wait till to find that out, right? Because 50-50 in America, if they're still married. <laughs> but um, um, they raised us with an ethic that if they ever had a nickel or a dime more, they didn't put into a nicer car or a nicer house. They would send us on trips, not vacations, but trips. Oh, they were early in this whole thinking about Yeah, like they wanted us to grow things, yeah. and be a part of the world. My sister has been an exchange student in Indonesia and New Zealand and Thailand. I've lived in Burma and Eritrea and Japan. And so they brought us here um, and this place captured my, my heart. I loved it. We went to Delhi, Bombay, Jantanalora, Varanasi, Jaipur, Udaipur, um, you know, saw kind of the highlights, but a lot of them. And then when I was in college, I had to pick a foreign language, so I took Hindi, just kind of on a whim, which is pretty rusty, so I can say a few things. We but were, I was, to I wanted to ask him a question in Hindi, but so he understands. I said my Hindi ear is worse than my Hindi tongue, so. Tongue, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> but then I came back when I was 19, because my college roommate, who was just randomly assigned to me my first year, my second year in college, he said, my father has just become the U.S. ambassador to India. Wow. Do you want to go to India? So my second trip was actually staying at the U.S. embassy here with an ambassador, never dreaming that one day I'd actually be in that position. So, yeah. so history goes way back, uh, studied Indian culture, history, religion, 
Um, and I was going to live here my junior year abroad in Bodh Gaya, you know, where Buddha was enlightened and do a Buddhist studies program. But I ran for student council and got elected, so I felt like I should fulfill my promise to the voters, and I never came, and I thought I'd never live here. But India has this way of kind of grabbing you and pulling you back. It does. And as does Joe Biden in my case. So Joe Biden and, <laughs> and India somehow got me back here. Got you back. Well, that's incredible. We're going to talk a, a bunch about, obviously, your connection and your role um, as, as being probably the most Indophile um, U.S. ambassador we've ever had, uh, or at least India has ever had. So uh, let's get into the spicy part of the questions. Yes. Um, visa issues. Yes. Big issue. Yeah. Um, the backlog has come down from 1,000 days yep. to 300 days. Um, still a lot. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking as the ambassador to hopefully solve that? I know the State Department has said to us many times yeah. that they were going to solve it by end of 2023. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a problem that's a really great problem to have. First of all, it reflects how many Indians want to come to the United States. Um, you know, I've talked to past ambassadors and they say, oh, I think visas to most ambassadors are headaches. And to me, since I come from municipal government, I served as a mayor for nine and a half years, as a council member for more than a decade before that, I love solving problems that have to do with systems. And if, when I was a council member or a mayor, our main product was like, you know, I used to joke filling potholes, right? Making smooth streets. For any embassy, it might be sexy to do diplomacy and defense deals and this, that, but really what our bread and butter is, is visas. Right. That's what we're there for. So I've really dived into this, and President Biden said to me, can you work hard to bring down the visa wait time? I don't know this for sure, but I bet it's the only time a United States president has told an ambassador, please work on visa issues. <laughs> because we all have Indian friends who all day long are lighting up our emails, our phones, our you know, social media handles, like I've got a cousin's barber's friend's wife who's having an issue and this happened. Um, I'm very proud of what we've done in, in less than a year here. We increased by 60 plus percent the number of visas that we adjudicated and gave out last year, a brand new record, and we reduced by 75 percent the wait time. It's now more like about 250, which still for new visas. And remember, of course, there's five million Indians that already have visas that can travel and come back, and those are usually good for a good decade. So this is really only for new first-time uh, tourist visas, tourist slash business visas. But I attack it three ways. One is what we can do in the short term, and we brought those times down by really building out our facilities and getting more out of the same number of people. Two is by expanding for the long term what our capacity is. We're second only to Mexico now. Mexico, which will always be number one right. as a border country right. and given our demographics. But think about that. India is now number two, and in some, certain categories, number one. India passed China and now is double China in terms of number of students that got student visas last year. Well, I have all the stats. One-fourth of all students, yeah. internationals in the U.S., I don't know if you know this, yep. is, are, is Indians. Yep. I, when I left here in 99, I went from India to Indiana, not like each other. Nothing like each other. My it's wife's a, from Indiana. I always joke she's from a foreign country. But. So, uh, so in 99 when I went, and you could find like four actual Indians. There were some, some like Indi U.S.-born Indians. Yeah. I went back uh, a few months ago, and every street corner you can literally hear Hindi. And yeah. I'm saying, like, what's going on? Well, there's a chaiwala in you know, Indianapolis at the, the gas station. But you know, it's incredible that yeah. uh, the student visa. So, Talk about how important the student part is. The student piece is amazing. So students are number one from India now, like I said, and I don't think that will ever change in any time in the near future. Um, obviously, it's in certain areas, STEM, engineering, some medicine. It's usually graduate students, so there's actually more Chinese students still in the US because they're more undergraduate okay. quite often. So really interested in what we can do to bring more undergraduate Indians here as well. Um, but we also see that these are the ambassadors that for the rest of their lives are the bridge between the US and India. Right. And I've just, I described to the president before the prime minister here came to Washington for the state dinner last June, right. that if you had to describe the US-India relationship, and it was a bridge, from India to the US, it's a beautiful, steel-reinforced, four-lane highway bridge that is just gorgeous to look at. From the US to India, it's like a rickety rope bridge with every other plank missing. In other words, you know, the amount of 
action coming from here to the United States, whether that's students, whether that's just knowledge about America, is very high. Americans don't know India and Indians like India and Indians know America and Americans. And I think there's an awakening happening now, so this is going to be more of a two-way street of people coming here. More American students studied in Costa Rica last year, university students, than in India. Think wow. about that. I mean, that says a lot about Costa Rica. I think we'd all love to go to Costa Rica, but... Is there anybody from, anybody from Costa Rica any, here by Costa Ricans? No? No? Yeah. no? Okay. We invited three of them, but they couldn't get their visas. Um, <laughs> it was, for me, you know, building this bridge to be as strong from the U.S. to India, and Americans really do know Indians now. One in four Americans have been treated by an Indian origin doctor inside the United States now. And not just U U.S., it's a yeah. lot of countries. A yeah. lot of countries. I mean, obviously, UK definitely. you know cuisine. Now you can find Indian restaurants almost everywhere. Can you, ex oh. can you dispel the notion for the non-Indians mm. here that when they talk about Indian food, mm. it's not just butter, butter chicken, chicken. <laughs> and like naan and what, what else do you guys like? Wasn't there just a, uh, there's an op-ed about this, or there's a New York Times article, you know, the, this battle of like who invented butter chicken here, which is Indian and from India, but um, we're, we're, it was an Indian American saying, if one more friend tells me that she loves Indian food, it's, I love butter chicken and dal and all the garlic naan I can eat, and that's all they know. Um, you know, Indian food is as diverse as any place in the world, but it's also subtle differences, I think, to the non-Indian palate. So you come here and, you know, the dal will change from village to village. Course, yeah. And, you know, I'm sure your mom has a recipe, but they'll describe, well, I like this specific kind of black lentils. We roast them before we then put them in the dal, and the ghee, the butter, comes from the specific cow that my cousin owns because it's really perfect, and this is, you know, the great recipe. Yeah. Um, but the subtleties and even the dramatic differences, north, south, east, west, are huge. And so, you know, one of the ways I've tried to engage as a diplomat is through food. Yeah, and what's your role so f to, to sort of... I mean, I, first of all, it's a way to connect with Indians. So whenever, I, I've been to 22 of the 36 states and territories, and before I go to one of those territories, I'll go to that state house here. So each of the states have a bawan, a house here, like... Imagine in Washington, D.C., there's a Texas house and a California house, and they serve food that's right. from those states. Which is really good, by the way. And I'll make a video and eat the food, and people, no, no pun intended, eat it up. I mean, it's, I always say being a good diplomat is putting a mirror up to the people where you're living and showing them what they remind, with, reminding them what they love best about themselves, whether it's food, whether it's sports, cricket. You know, engage with people where they live, how they eat, the sports and art that they consume. And to me, that's been one of the best things is eating my way through India. But it, it's exhausting. My stomach is, I haven't gotten deli belly or anything like that. It's exhausting because Indians are so hospitable. If you don't leave food on the plate, they'll just keep serving. So you have to, like as an American who was trained to always clean my plate, if I do that, I'm going to be eating like seven platefuls <laughs> before I stumble out from that meal to the next meal. <laughs> so in terms of, I don't know what the right phrase is, dispelling or your role as the ambassador and the embassy's role in helping increase, bringing it a little bit to the travel industry, if yeah. you will, uh, helping tourism grow sort of both sides. Yeah. How, 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 should we, how, how should the travel industry think about interacting yeah. with the embassy and the machinery? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a huge opportunity for both countries. As we all know, tourism is like the greatest export. You know, you're able to bring people together. We have the four Ps uh, that are part of our mission, peace, prosperity, planet, and people. And while I do think there's probably a role that tourism has in promoting peace through understanding, whether it's protecting our planet, whether it's promoting prosperity through economic development and jobs, right. um, or whether it's the people-to-people -people ties, it really hits all of them. I think very few Americans come to India. A part of that is that India has an extremely robust, beautiful, developed tourism uh, infrastructure in a few places, a few but places, not most. Right, right. Um, you know, I've blown away. In years past when I've gone in India, there have been more non-Indians traveling than now. It's rare when I'm on a plane where I'm the ol not the only non-Indian. And that's amazing to see, you know, oh. India's opening a, a new airport a week. A new airport a week. Let that settle in for a second. 
It's and, huge. And in the U.S., scale. What, what's the equivalent to that? A new We're opening a new airport every decade in the United States. It's <laughs> cutting edge. Actually, come to LAX. It actually, maybe you may, it may be less than that. No, no, no. Come to LAX, where I've put you know ten years, and it's going to be the most beautiful airport very soon. Well, LAX um, is much better. So yeah, now. And, it's, and we're going to get a people mover opening now. Now I sound like the mayor of LA. Uh, our first people mover, every terminal redone, some new ones. But you know, we're we're slower on the infrastructure side here. It's breathtaking. Like, you know, the airlines, uh, Indigo, which I just flew. I mean, is one of the fastest growing. It'll be the number one airline probably in the world in a couple years yeah. in terms of passenger volume. Um, you know what's happening with Vistara, and I know you had Air India up here, uh, Acosta, you know, all these other ones that are kind of turning around from the reputation, oh, Indian carriers are the worst, or suddenly Indian carriers are among the best. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done to promote India as a tourism destination. And then flip that, I really want to bring more Indians to America. Um, as the middle class comes up here, as we saw like Los Angeles, my old city, uh, Chinese tourists were really a huge, huge part of our economy. Yeah. That's dropped off for geopolitical reasons and economic reasons. Um, and instead of crying about that, I'm like, so here we have friends, two democracies, we think alike, we feel alike, we're interested in each other. I told the president before the state visit, the good news is we're the most popular country in the world in India. In fact, in a recent poll, Indians like Americans more than Americans like Americans. So. Well, well. Well, that's not that's an easy one. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that every all the ingredients are there. Now we just have to execute. And the role of the embassy is these convenings. It's the messaging that we can do, new routes. I've been talking to Air India, and this year, as you've heard announced, so um, they'll be coming So ambassador's role is also making sure that the flights and between Absolutely. the Absolutely. It's getting planes to them. You know, it's making sure they have the visas to get their folks out to train on, you know, the Boeings that will come here. Right. That'll be a part of the expansion. So it, there's a lot of role and a lot, of, um, a lot of focus that we put on the tourism industry. Okay. And so, um, switching, oh, going back a little bit to yep. Americans coming to, to, uh, to India, uh, one of the big issues, you know this very well, mm -hmm. has been the perception of safety. Yep. Not just perception, the reality yep. of safety as well. Sure. And I know I've seen some of the interviews where some of your role mm -hmm. is helping um, sort of Clarify the, mm -hmm. when tourists come, or even just business people come, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. the safety issues in India. Absolutely. So how do you think about that? So the State Department always puts out travel advisories, whether it's for a country or parts of country when there's unrest, um, and vice versa. I mean, this is two ways, right? We read articles about tragic things that are happening to Indians who are living in the United States. These are big countries. We now have so many people. These are always the exceptions, not the rule. But if you're the victim of or a family member of somebody that something tragic has happened to, we take that very, very seriously. So we have a two-way two role to help Indians who are coming to the U.S. know what to expect and how to stay safe and vice versa. But by and large, I mean, just statistically, it is, they're both countries very safe to travel to, very safe to visit, but there's basic things you have to be aware of. Women travelers especially, I'll have to be aware of that too and talk to Indian women about kind of safety, public transportation and other things. And we have those issues in the United States too. So we come from a place of humility about that. But I think um, you don't want the message to be don't come to either country because of safety. That is you know, rarely the case. But just because you're on vacation, don't be stupid. You know, take precautions, make sure you know where you are, be with people. Um, and depending on what regions you want to go, it's always the more adventuresome traveler who can right. get, you know, might not be a criminal issue. It might be we had travelers who had um, a hike in a remote part of the Himalayas and there was an avalanche and they, were, they lost their shoes and were stuck and couldn't hike out. Um, but we have a very robust American citizen services. It's one of the main things we do in the embassy to assist Americans right. should they get in any trouble while they're here. And so there's always an American diplomat here to help you. So I don't have a great segue, but since you used the word public transport, can we play the video? This is not a great segue, but at least we want to play this video. Delhi Metro, Mira Metro. Yes. <laughs> Well, 
I really wanted to get this played because of the music so that the energy yeah, levels exactly, go up uh, exactly. as well. So it's, it's, it's such a great music. So, um, so you do a lot of out and about. Like you said, you, 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 uh, you visited 22 states. Yeah. You uh, do this. You did a cricket match. I don't know how good you are at cricket versus baseball. I, you know, I can, I'm a better uh, batter than I am bowler right now, but it's, my message to Americans is don't be scared of cricket. And you can actually explain cricket because Americans always say, I don't understand it. I had the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State here, and we were waiting to meet with the Prime Minister, and one of them said that. I took four glasses and in a minute explained cricket. If you didn't know baseball, you'd need probably an hour to explain it with all the yes, rules. Yes, and yes. it's great. And the long, days-long test matches, which still that's, I don't probably have the patience for. That's the perception for. still, yeah. The T20, which is like a three-hour match, is one of the most exciting things. And the second most streams of cricket in the world are in the United States of America, of any I'm country. I'm one of them, yeah. yeah I'm course, sure you yeah, are. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. And, and so I'd like to invite all of our Indian friends also to come to the United States this year because we're going to be one of the host countries of the T20 World Cup. Um, and we just launched Major League Cricket in uh, the United Texas, States yeah. um, last year uh, in my hometown, Shah Rukh Khan, the great you know, movie star, owns the Los Angeles Knight oh, Riders. Shah Rukh Khan Lighters. has been mentioned six times since the morning, by the way. Exactly, you've got to, exactly. Imagine, yes. Um, so, yeah, I do get out and about. Um, and on cricket, the most exciting well, thing so, I think I did. Well, so yeah. let me, let me, let me set ahead, this up. Go ahead, cue it up. This person is responsible, single-handedly, well, he won't say this, uh, for bringing cricket to the Olympics. So... Please go ahead. Sure. <laughs> that, that applause you hear is Indians counting the medals already in 2028. Two medals, men's so and women's. I never would have imagined that all of these things would come together. I didn't know that I'd be ambassador to India, let alone when India was hosting the International Olympic Committee here a few months ago for the first time in over 40 years for their annual meeting, let alone when it was during the Cricket World Cup, let alone on the day of the India-Pakistan match, the world's biggest let alone two days after we resolved the very intense negotiations between the Olympics and the LA 28 games about the five sports we would add. But Casey Wasserman, who chairs our games and good friend who I recruited to do that job, and I wanted to put cricket in years ago because we, this is the biggest, most watched sport that's not in the Olympics. And we resolved it and I got to, at that meeting, announce that 2028, for men and women, we will have cricket in the Olympics um, Actually, for the second time, I think in like 1896 or something, there was a game being played next to the Olympics, and they said, okay, we're counting that as the Olympics, and England beat France, and it never happened again. But America's cricket creds are real. The first international match ever played was in the United States. That's what I heard. In the 1840s yeah, yeah. against Canada. Do you think so, this league will succeed in the U.S.? I think it'll take about a decade, but if, here's your investment tip. Invest in Major League Cricket now the payoff will be big in the future. It's kind of like Major League Soccer, everybody said wasn't going to succeed, and now those teams are so big. Yes, of the, course. the IPL, the Indian Premier League teams here, the franchises, are the second most valuable teams in the world for any sport after NFL. More than Premier League Soccer or football, more than NBA teams. I mean, it's crazy how much value is in there. And that move alone, by the way, made the Olympic rights here in India go from like, you know, 50,000 a year sure, to like, yeah tens of millions, if not more. So that will actually help us build some cricket infrastructure in Los Angeles, a new stadium, a pitch, you know, as well. So it's a win-win for everybody. How important is the diaspora, in term, the, the, the Indian diaspora in US? I'm sort of one of them. But, you know, all the, all the big CEOs now of all the tech companies are all, uh, all Indian origin uh, there. So uh, how does that help your job? How does it help? sort of the bridge between the two countries? I mean, it's our secret weapon. It's, inc it's incredible. I mean, when I think about it in political terms, this administration, we have a daughter of an immigrant from India as the second most powerful person in the US government, and Kamala Harris. We've got folks who have, you know, when I go through who serves in the Biden administration, we probably have more Indian Americans from Surgeon General to the head of our uh, drug policy to the head of presidential personnel to, I mean, you go straight through and then at the National Science Foundation. And when they visit here, some of them were born in India and are immigrants, yeah, they're not just Indian right. American. It is, there's a fluency that um, really allows us to take this relationship to the highest level by far that it's ever been. When Prime Minister Modi visited last year, a state visit is very symbolic, but also has some substance, you know, two or three things that you agree on to do. We were tracking 173 different deliverables 
everything from higher education and cultural exchange to defense partnership um, to trade deals. It's astounding how much, you know, the U.S.-India relationship is probably the most consequential in the world today. And that's what the president says. And I know no president oh. has ever said that. So the Indian-American, so that's government. As you said, business, the old cliche was you couldn't make it as a CEO if you're Indian-American. Now you can't make it as a CEO if you're not Indian-American. I mean, it's, yes, yes. it's what across the board. What explains from your perspective, like from, from an American, mm -hmm. you as an American now sitting in India, what explains the success on the, on the top levels, Microsoft, is that all this, everybody? Well, well one thing is just kind of, a truism, and the other one is more a values-driven answer. The first piece is, of course, those who, you take a country as big as this, and if you take the most motivated, highest skilled, sometimes right. most well-off folks of any country, right. and take them into a place like America, of course, they're going to be incredibly successful. I think people of Indian origin are about 1.4% of the population. It's 6% of the tax base of America. So think about like that multiplier, wow. probably the most successful. But the, the values-based one, it's not just that we got the cream of the crop coming from India. It's also, I think, that the Indian dream is what we used to refer to as the American dream, that sometimes we're even down on in America. We should learn from India how to revive our own confidence about that. It doesn't matter where you come from, what language your parents spoke, how much money they had, how they worshiped God, um, you know, what their background was. Like, study hard, get a scholarship, go to a great place, get a good job, become an entrepreneur, and that really is the India of today. Even for those who never will come to the United States, yeah. it's the most competitive startup ecosystem in the world, it's the most dynamic, optimistic population and youngest population. That's true. I mean, Indians 15 years and younger are equal to the US population. So it's a place of immense promise, and it really, I think, the success we see in the US is mirrored in that same attitude here as India comes into its own, that you know, this Indian dream might just be achievable for everyone. Thank you, Ambassador. That was amazing. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.